Welcome back to another Run the Damn Ball podcast. It is a new year. There's a lot to look forward to. We got Andrew Pfeiffer and Sam Alessandro with us today to talk about the latest news in Husky football and also college football, including the transfer portal. Also, bowl season's coming to an end on Monday when Alabama faces Georgia in the national championship. We also talk about some men's and women's Nebraska ball. So here we go. We'll start with the transfer portal. So what have you guys seen lately in the transfer portal? It's like major moves that have been made. Well, I would say, Daniel, that, I mean, the transfer portal, it's just like the wild, wild west right now. It, everything's crazy. There's so many guys entering the portal. And especially, like, if you like at the quarterback position, like, if you're a backup quarterback, it's almost like a given that you're entering the portal. Um, and at this point, like, it, it's just crazy. And it's – it's getting to the point where I think like the NCAA, they're like losing total control of like what's going on because there's so many guys that have entered the portal. And I'm afraid like all these guys entering the portal, they might not ever find schools. It's and hard to, it's hard to keep track of. There's so many transactions and different movements to where it's like, you know, you could say we're going to talk all day long about how Nebraska's had such a successful transfer season but you know you can take a look at a lot of other teams and say the same thing so it, it's a lot to keep track of keep going say i'm sorry but like like i was saying the the portal like there, there's no regulation to it and so right now you're just seeing this absolute like craziness and like we already had a crazy coaching carousel where a bunch of coaches were leaving programs that we weren't really expecting to leave and so you're having more and more guys uh, enter the portal um, for Nebraska. It's been pretty good, I think, for them. Uh, obviously, they they need to add a lot of pieces, I think, especially on the O O line and uh, in the quarterback position as well. They added uh, Casey Thompson because I think you know Nebraska they didn't have as strong of a recruiting class this signing period, but. Uh, I think they did that strategic, strategically so they could add some more impact players that can play right away, uh, like last year with Samari Toure being an impact transfer last year. I think that's why they've attacked the portal as hard as as they have. But yeah. I remember, yeah, yeah. I remember you said like a month ago we were doing this podcast and you literally said, "I'll just jump right to it because you know we you mentioned Casey Thompson." You said Nebraska needs to hit the transfer portal hard, and they just have done that within the last couple of days. Um, Casey Thompson, former Texas quarterback, uh, I think I believe he played. He started maybe half the games for UT last year. He did. I don't remember exactly what game it was. It may have been the Oklahoma game, but some D lineman stepped on his hand. I think it was in the Oklahoma game that he was playing in, and I think it was uh, the Oklahoma game when they were trying to when they like blew the lead and then they were trying to come back. Cause he oh. was on fire for them. And they were up like 28, seven on tech on a uh, OU. Cause he played for Texas, obviously that played at OU interestingly enough, but um, yeah, he, yeah. he got his hand stepped on and he really couldn't throw the ball that well the rest of the year. But when he's a hundred percent, I would argue he's, he has a potential to be a better quarterback than Adrian was last year. And Adrian was pretty dang good minus the lack of clutch genes. So yeah. Well, here's what I'll say about that, actually. So he, you talked about how he got his hand stepped on at the Oklahoma game. And I don't know if you saw the pictures, but, like, well, I'm not even kidding. He was throwing hand was, like, probably triple the size of his actual hand. And he still went on and had a pretty dang good season playing through an injury like that. And to me, that's almost kind of like – it sounds like someone we know playing through yeah, an injury the entire season. Pretty. Well, I will say this. Looking at Casey Thompson's stats right now, he had 24 touchdowns and nine picks this year and 2,100 passing yards. Pretty solid uh, numbers. He was, 10. he was injured. But then you look at the Oklahoma game, he was 20 of 34 passing, which is okay. That's about 59% completion percentage. But the numbers here, 388 passing yards, five touchdowns, no picks. That's pretty impressive. And so I think you look at Casey Thompson, especially, he's a very uh, talented passer. And that's exactly 
like he he can obviously run. He's a pretty a- athletic guy, but I think he's a pass first quarterback who can run if necessary. And that's exactly what the new offensive coordinator, Mark mm-hmm. Whipple, wants when he's running his offense. I was literally just going to say that Mark Whipple's the type of coach that's like, get the ball in your quarterback's hands, find your receiver, make the read, go throw it. And there's not really a whole lot of time for dancing, messing around. And I wanted to go back and kind of look at the Texas football schedule. Yes, they didn't have a great year, but you also have to understand how many points their offense put up. And with a lackluster defense, that is mostly why Texas lost a lot of those big games. Like, for instance, they put up 70 on Texas Tech, 58 on Rice, 21 on Arkansas, and then they put up 56 on Kansas. Obviously, their offense is not the issue. Texas clearly had another problem, especially when it came to their defense. Casey Thompson was not Texas's issue. Texas's issue was their defense, but their offense was very productive, like I said, was putting up all those points. And I think he'll fit the scheme and the culture perfectly at Nebraska. Yeah, I agree. Um, his dad played at OU and was their starting QB in 1987. And I yeah. think they beat number one Nebraska that year. I saw that on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of cool that his son is playing at, um, you know, OU's two rivals. And now hopefully he can, you know, I mean, two cursed programs, Texas and Nebraska. Hopefully, you know, we can turn that around next year with him potentially being the starter. I would say, you know, if he's full health, he's the best guy we got at QB. And now my, my question is that I want to raise is, is he, because Nebraska is so successful in the transfer portal time and time again, do you guys, obviously the NIL makes a huge difference. I know Sam, you and I were just talking about last night, how Martinez's season salary was upwards of probably one and a half, 150 K North of that. And so I don't know if that's more or less of an incentive to get quarterbacks to come to Nebraska and that could be why they're so successful in the transfer portal now because of the NIL, because Nebraska is such a marketable brand. But I don't know if that – do you guys think the NIL plays a huge role in that, or do you think it's just because clearly the culture at Nebraska is just unmatched and they're they're actually believing in Frost and the tipping point and whatnot? You know I, mean, what I mean, with NIL right now, I feel like if you're just a quarterback in, on a Power 5 team, no matter what, you're going to make decent money. Uh, it doesn't really matter what school you're at. Obviously, if you're at, like, Bama, it might be a little bit more than, like, if you're at Cal. But, oh, you know, yeah. I, I think if you if you look at all the quarterback transfers right now, they're all going to places where they can make some money. But, like, in the long run, I think it's more beneficiary for the quarterbacks if they go – to a program that will help elevate their game so then they can make it to the NFL well, where you will make even more money. And see, that that, that, that has been the Nebraska's problem time and time again because that's why we lost players like J.D. Spielman and Wondell Robinson and having players leave because they don't believe their capital's getting any higher than it was. And granted, Wondell Robinson's doing a phenomenal job in Kentucky, but J.D. Spielman didn't do much, but I know he had some off-the-field issues as well but that has been a problem for Nebraska in the past is that players were wanting to leave because they don't believe that Nebraska will help exceed their capital overall as a player. So now all of a sudden people are starting to take notice and turning and coming to Nebraska, which is just interesting to me. I had a little bit of Twitter argument about this. I personally don't want another quarterback transfer. I think we're set. I think we're set. We have three young guys and one older guy. If we add another, we're guaranteeing that we get another transfer out. So I just don't think it's worth it. I get you want to always get the best guy, but that's just where I stand. Can I read a tweet that I think, Sam, you sent it to me? I'm not sure. I I 100% agree. I think Logan Smothers is a talented guy. He showed, I think, enough promise in the Iowa game to be like, hey, that guy's a serviceable, you know, quarterback. I think having Casey Thompson there, though, at the very least, he'll bring out the best in Smothers in the competition and help him mature as a quarterback. And I mean that I think that's good. So but yeah, I would agree, Daniel. I think the quarterbacks that they have on campus and then the guys that are coming in, uh Torres and then now Casey Thompson, I think that's plenty. Especially when you look at I feel like if you bring in another guy, then you're gonna have like maybe Smothers or someone else leave and then you're back 
to where you were at. So I don't really see the the benefit to adding another quarterback. Um, can I read a tweet that I found? And it kind of made me – here's your daily dose of Kool-Aid for those listening. Um, it was the – I guess more or less the projected starting lineup. Um, so for the quarterback, this is two to three – people per position so keep in mind it's interchangeable obviously but at quarterback the quarterback room right now it looks like Casey Thompson and Logan Smothers and of course we have Heinrich Harburg and then running backs it's Ramir Johnson, Jacques Yant, and then Gabe Urban who's coming back from an injury and then the wide receiver room Omar Manning, Xavier Betts, DeColdis Crawford, and Elante Brown and the uh, commit from LSU I forget his name too. Um, well Paul Palmer who we can talk about as well, I mean, he was a four slash five star out of high school and now um, had a decent year at LSU last year. And, you know, because we got M- Mickey Joseph, now we have, you know, really talented wide receiver and Trey Palmer. So the yeah. wide receiver room is stacked. All we need is a QB who's consistent and an O-line. I agree. And um, at one point, he was actually the number two ranked wide receiver in the country. And he was an X five star, somehow turned four star. I'm not sure entirely how that system works. But – He'll be in the receiving room as well. Um, Alante Brown will get some action. And then tight end, we'll have uh, Fedoni and Vokalek will be making his return. If you look at Trey Palmer, at the very least, he's going to be a great special teams player. He's a return specialist. And he's also really, really fast. And so he's a guy that can potentially take the top off on the defense. And that will just make it easier for some of the other receivers to get open as well. So, yeah, I, I'm really excited about the – the, the last two additions, I think, have been as good as, as any for Nebraska because, honestly, like, there were a few quarterbacks in the portal that, like, I think were rumored to come to Nebraska. I know, Daniel, about a month ago when we were talking last, we mentioned how we liked Bo Nix. That was, like, going to be – that would be, like, a good, a good pickup because, obviously, he had played in a lot of big games and whatnot. Casey Thompson was a guy that – I also think it would be an interesting, you know, I think he's interesting because he's played in a lot of big games. He knows what it's like to be the quarterback at a huge school, you know, Texas and now Nebraska. He knows how to deal with that pressure and he's played in a lot of big games. I mean, one of his best games ever was in one of the best college football rivalries, the Oklahoma game this past year. So um, yeah, I'm, you, you know, I'm still cautious about my optimism of the team because there's still a long ways to go, I think. But this this is a step towards the right direction, I think, for the program, uh, adding some of these impact players that can really help make Nebraska's offense at least a little bit more consistent. Because we've seen them at times be really good and then at times be really bad. Yeah, we really have. Um, Did you guys see uh, the projected Big Ten power rankings for 2022? I don't even want to. It's too, it's too far ahead. Way too early. Way too early. You can go I ahead. Way too early, but I just think Just it's tell us where Nebraska is. 12. Fair. We should have our own category. Like, just everyone, and then we're just over here, like, almost beating Michigan and then losing. Like, come yeah. on. Especially adding all these transfers. Like, we don't know, obviously – I think they'll be good additions, but you still don't know. Like, this is a lot of guys that are going to be gone next year. We're not even going – we haven't even mentioned the fact, all the impact defensive players that that Nebraska is going to be losing. I still yeah. think that – but, like, there's going to be a lot – there's a lot of turnover, and I still think this is just the beginning for Nebraska. I do have a question about uh, the transfer portal. How come you don't really see a whole lot of linemen? There are. I don't – well, I mean, they don't obviously get publicized enough, but that's just, you know – There's over a thousand I mean. players in the portal right now. But what I'm curious is about, do you yeah. think Scott Frost is targeting those offensive linemen? So we well, got one like a week ago. I don't know if you guys saw the picture of the – Hunter Anthony. Hunter Anthony doing the splits, and then, you know, Will Compton was flaming yeah. him for it, which was hilarious. Um, so we picked up him. I don't know what he was ranked in high school, but he did play a bunch of games at Oklahoma State, I believe. <laughs> He's actually he's like six seven, three twenty or something. Yeah, he like started I think like almost half the games this year, and he's go- he's a grad transfer. That's why he's coming 
up here, but he was actually one of the guys that uh, gave Mike Gundy the Gatorade bath in the bowl game. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so – and then he committed the literally the next day, so. Dang. That was another thing we saw. Guys who are in the transfer portal were playing in bowl games. Like the Florida court, he still hasn't officially entered the portal. Uh, Emery Jones – and then Caleb Williams, too, played and then entered the portal like 24 hours later. Williams may stay at OU, but I don't know for sure. Well, did you see today Oklahoma just offered uh, Chubba Purdy, who Nebraska has offered, too. Yeah. And they picked up Dylan Gabriel uh, we- recently, the UCF. Yeah. He, he committed. He committed. That was funny. It was like Caleb Williams tra- entered the portal and he said, oh, I still might co- go to go back to Oklahoma. And then, uh, like, not even, like, an hour and a half later, Dylan Gabriel committed to Oklahoma. Even yeah. though he, it looked like he was going to go to UCLA. But, I mean, that, that just tells you right there the craziness of the portal. You know, I think there does need to be some sort of regulation. Because I'm all for players, like, player mobility and being able to play, play where you want to. But, like, I do think – you know, transferring after like two games or something like that. I don't think you should probably do that. Yeah, I agree. Plus, it like people will be reported to be in the portal, but they actually haven't entered the portal. You know what I mean? It'll be like, yeah. oh, this person's transferring, but they actually haven't like fully. And then, Andrew, you said earlier, sometimes, you know, guys will never pan out, even though they're ranked high. Like we had a corner, uh, Nadab Joseph, who he didn't enter the portal, but he's no longer on the team. I mean, he was a four-star in high school. And he never, he barely ever played here. Look at JUCO transfer number one running back in the world, Greg Bell. And you know how that pan, how that. Pan well, he did out. pan out, but at a different school. Yeah, yeah. great player at San Diego State this year. Taking in anyone from the transfer portal, you always have to take with a grain of salt because, I mean, think about it. They're tra- like they left a certain program for a reason. That wasn't attracted to him, maybe because they didn't get a job, maybe because they weren't going to get any playing time. They're leaving for some problematic reason. Who's to say that same problematic reason won't end up at the next school they go to take Luke McCaffrey, for example. But I'm not saying that's what's going to happen in the transfer portal. I'm, well, I'm just kind of backing what you said. Nothing is nothing is in stone, and it could pan out completely differently. It depends. It really yeah. depends. Because you could get a Wandale or a Samori Toure, and those guys are going to be like top five players for your team. And then you get like a guy who never plays. Like it's literally anything in between as well. So um, another thing that I want to talk about is I saw this. I'd always kind of had it on my mind, but Maurice Washington actually found a school. And, you know, he, he was, I think he was on parole for like two years. And he, now he's going to be at Grambling State, which is, you know, HBCU, FCS school. Um, so that was, you know, he was a really good player for us. So we'll see what he does there. Um, what do y'all think about that? I'm happy for him. Me too. Like, you know, he's a very, very talented athlete and he's very quick and I'm glad he found somewhere to play ball. I just, you know, hope he gets his off the field issues fixed, but, you know, having had him for the short time that we did, you know, there was stuff that he obviously needed to work on, but, you know, if there's another school that's willing to give him a chance, then I wish the best of luck to him. And that's really all I have to say. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the, he's probably the most talented running back I've seen Nebraska have since Amir Abdul was on campus. So it's, it's good to see him back on his feet and, you know, playing football again. Cause I think a lot of people will say like, he was very talented, a very talented guy. Um, Obviously had some off the field troubles, but uh, yeah, good good to see him uh, back out there. I think that's a pretty good landing spot for him too. I think he has a chance to succeed uh, pretty early on when he gets there. Yeah, well, that'll be something to look at this coming season. So I have this further down in the notes, but I have a little rant about something we saw. So we just had bowl season. Kentucky beat Iowa, like, at the end of the game. Wanda had a big, like, 60-yard reception. It was awesome to see. I was like, yes, Iowa lost. Wandale did it to him. I, I'm not loyal to Wandale either. Like, I'm not, like, a, you know, I'm not following everything he does. He had a great year. Um, but then all the all the Nebraska, you just – negative Nebraska people on Twitter just immediately turned into 
like, oh, well, that was a great game, but we lost him and we're the worst thing ever. And I'm just like, okay, can like, there's just no middle ground here. You know, I, I mean, did y'all feel the same way? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I loved watching Wandale do that one play towards the end of the game when he juked out the Iowa corner, who, by the way, was the guy who was talking uh, a lot of trash to Wandale earlier on in the week, uh, saying that – or not not just Wandale, but the whole team saying that, you know, this is a big opportunity for Kentucky because they've never been to, like, a big bowl game before. And then Wandale, like, quote, retweeted it and was like, I mean, these guys have been in bowl games. I haven't been in one, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see on the field. And, of course, at the end of the game, puts them on skates. And then Kentucky Twitter was just roasting the heck out of that DB. Uh, and so that was really funny. But, yeah, Daniel, I 100% agree with that. I mean, just be happy for the kid. I, I don't know why you need to be, like, petty and whatnot. I'm sure – you know if Adrian Martinez has like a game winning touchdown or something like that next year for Kansas State. And I hope he does. I hope he succeeds because he deserves it. He gave a lot to the program. Yeah. Uh, and you know, like Nebraska Twitter is just going to be there, – there's going to be obviously a lot of people that are like, hey, good for him. But then there's going to be those guys, you know, the the trolls. That's the, yeah. it's the positive and the negative of social media. So, like, where I'm at it, where, where I stand with it, it's like, there'd be some people who would follow every single Wandale game and then make, like, a statement about how, like, we screwed up the situation with Wandale. Okay, like, last season, like, 2020 I'm talking about, like, I guess two seasons ago, when Wandale was forced to play running back most of the year, that was because our best running back, Mills, was hurt most of the year. Our young guys were also hurt or not ready to play. And that was our best option at running back was Wandale. So, like, you know, is he, like, someone that can sustainably be a running back? No. Should he have been playing wide receiver? Yes. But, like, we had Luke McCaffrey and A.J. Martinez throwing to him in the cold weather of, like, December. What do you – like, you know, and Wandale did the right thing to transfer. He had a great year, and now he's going to go to the pros next year. So, um, I'm happy for him. And, like, two things can be true at the same time. He didn't want to be here anymore. And he left. And part of that is because, I mean, I could go in depth to it more, but he, he didn't want to be at Nebraska anymore. That's for sure. And so like, it's like, it's a win-win. And so I don't really think anything more needs to be said. And yeah, exactly what you said. When Adrian has a good year at Kansas state next year, which I think he will, everyone's going to say the same crap. So it's, it's going to be just dreadful. I, Cause I know like <laughs> knowing Nebraska too, like, it will happen. Like he's going to ball out. He's we need a, to he's win a, so badly, not only because we need to win so badly, so that all the Adrian Nebraska people, because there are literally people who will die for Adrian Martinez, and they're Nebraska fans, and I do not get it because he won, like, 11 games for us, okay? Like, in four years. Like, I don't get it. Like, I want him to do well, but we need to win bad because they're going to come out of the woodwork if we don't win games. So. Our yeah. hope on Casey <laughs> last Logan. Yeah. One of the two. I don't know. I'm. This is just my personal opinion. I'm tired of uh, the whole. I know it's a big part of Frost's system, but I, I just want a pocket passer. Uh, I'm waiting for the day that we get a pocket passer. Well, look at like look at Alabama. Bryce Young's an incredible passer who also probably runs like a four five four six. So it's like, yeah, our quarterback is pass first, but like if we need to, we can run for sixty yards. That's what we need. We don't want a guy – we don't want Logan or Casey running 25 times a game because we'll yeah. lose. Yeah. Well, Casey is not that kind of guy. If you've watched him, he is definitely a throw first. He is very athletic. But, like, I even remember them saying that uh, during the during the broadcast for uh, Texas, Oklahoma, they said, you know, his dad was a great athlete at Oklahoma. But, you know, he's kind of a different – type of quarterback because he he has a cannon like he he made one throw against Oklahoma it went like over 50 yards and it was actually to uh, a guy that some Nebraska fans wanted uh, Joshua Moore who entered the portal and because he was one time at one time in high school he was committed to Nebraska but uh, yeah Kate I, I agree 
Daniel, like you look at teams like Alabama and even like Clemson when they had Trevor Lawrence, like Trevor Lawrence, the reason why they beat Ohio State, like, yes, Trevor Lawrence was really a talented passer that sophomore season, but he they beat them because he ran the ball a few times and they were so they were shocked because it didn't really look like he was a fast guy, but he was an effective runner. And that's the same thing with like Bryce Young. He's an effective runner when he does go out there and, and run the ball. Same with uh, Kenny Pickett for uh, Pitt with uh, Mark Whipple this past year. He, he could run, but mm-hmm. pass first guy. You know what it kind of reminds me of? So we go back to a, an earlier quarterback in Nebraska history. So Taylor Martinez in his first, I'd say, two seasons ran the ball a lot and got hurt a lot. And then remember in 2012, I mean, that was his best year um, before he just could, he got injured too much and stopped playing. But in 2012, he had a really good passing season and he didn't need to run the ball that much. But when he did, it was like an 80 yard touchdown. And it was actually incredible to watch. Well, yeah. And it's kind of the same thing with like, I think of Tommy Armstrong when he was playing like that guy, he, he liked to launch it. He had an arm, but he could also, he wasn't like maybe as explosive runner as like Martinez, but like he could pick up like 10 to 15 yards and he didn't run the ball that much, but he could every once in a while. Yeah. It'd be nice to get that back. Cause that was, that's like a true dual threat. We really need, we don't want like a running back playing quarterback. I mean, Adrian could throw, but he ran the ball more than anyone. So um, we can move on to the next thing. Um, just talk about like college football bowl season coming to an end. Did y'all watch North Dakota State today? They destroyed Montana State in the FCS championship. Yeah, they're they're a dynasty, just like Alabama. Move them. I want them to be FBS because I feel like they would probably be a good team in the FBS oh. if they're doing this. One hundred percent. I think they would. I mean, it'd take them a little while to adjust, but they would at least be competitive for a few years, and then I guarantee you they would start to get like some big time guys. Because I mean, you look at they, they have a few players drafted in the NFL like every single year now. They have two guys that have been drafted in the top five in the last 10 years, Trey Lance and Carson Wentz. Like they're, they're becoming a factory. North Dakota State into the Big 12 and just watch what happens. They're like a better version of Iowa. Mm. North Dakota State is like actually – they're better than Iowa. I'm just going to say that right now because um, I beat them like five years ago. Also, uh, they would it'd be so funny to have like pa- like past happy Big Twelve go up against North Dakota State. Yeah, who's like the opposite? That'd be interesting. It's like playing Dynasty mode on the Xbox. It really is. Um, what were some of the what were some of the bowl games you guys liked? Mine was the Rose Bowl favorite one. Rose Bowl was amazing. Um, I also really liked was it uh, the Cotton Bowl. Uh, Oklahoma State, uh, Notre Dame. That was a great game because it looked like Notre Dame was going to run away with it. Marcus Freeman's first game as a head coach and then see the Pokes come all the way back, Mike Gundy, uh, to lead them to a victory. That's it's always good to to see the man with the mullet. Yeah. Hit the W. I also liked watching Iowa lose. That's that's always it's always nice. Uh, I really like the Fiesta Bowl, of course. Uh, that was definitely one of my favorites. Uh, Citrus Bowl, you can't go wrong. It's always fun watching Iowa lose. Um, other than that, you know, like you said, Sam, the college football playoff games were uh, very underwhelming. Both teams pretty much got blown out. Cincinnati kind of held in there. Not as big of a de- deficit as I thought it was going to be, but Michigan, yeah, they were very underwhelming games. Other than that, Air Force beat Louisville, which I thought was really interesting in the first responder bowl. Also, UAB beat BYU. I don't think BYU even really played anyone that good all year. So I kind of enjoyed seeing that. Mm. They were like thir- BYU was ranked 13th, so not that legit, really. It's just sad not seeing Nebraska in any of these games. I know. I mean, was Georgia it- and Bama are just ahead of everyone, though. Did you so say it was Rutgers that took the spot in the uh, bowl game? Well, uh, they had enough wins to be eligible. So, 
eligible to be like they weren't eligible because they were five and seven but like I, there's some rule like if you're if you have five wins and like good academics you can get into bowl or something you know strong enough schedule that's how nebraska was able to get into the foster farms bowl yeah and we won that game too the foster farms bowl <laughs> good times that was a good time back when mike riley had like some promise <laughs> yeah um what was i gonna say he just got hired at the usfl I forgot that was a thing. They haven't really been advertising it that much. And then I see an update on Twitter, like, yes, yeah, stars, baby. That Mike Riley was, was one of the coaches. I'm like, hey, good for him. 68 years old and still, still coaching. So I guess we could finish things off with some Nebraska ball. Um, the men played today against Rutgers. They lost by like 30. I watched parts of it, and then I was like, eh. I swear, every time I turn on the TV to watch men's Nebraska ball, like, the game will be fine. And then I turn it on, and they just start missing everything. Other team is draining everything. I, like, turned it off and went to go walk the dog. I was like, I can't watch Nebraska ball. And, of course, the women's team is balling out. They've only lost one game. Um, they beat Michigan last week, and that was exciting. They're probably going to rank us soon because we deserve it. Sam and I called an excellent game. We called the uh, Michigan game. Oh, y'all were on that? Yeah, yep. Sam and I were. That's and awesome. that was, Sam did a great job, and that was a really fun game to commentate because it was the Alexis Markowski show for most of the second half. She went insane that yeah. second half. That, that team is just fun to watch. I've said it on this podcast before, and I've said it to you guys a bunch. The men's team needs to watch the women's team because they – that team, they, they play – they have such good camaraderie and they play as a, as a unified group and team. And yeah, like Andrew said, Alexis Markowski in her first start just balled out against a top 10 team. And they she's got a freshman. Yeah. She's a freshman. They, a freshman. They, she's a freshman. You got like Jai Shelley, uh, impact transfer from Oregon and obviously some players that have been there for a while and have still continued to play well in Hybe and, uh, Isabel Bourne. So, yeah, th- they definitely should be ranked, but especially NCAA, uh, rank us, you cowards. Well, they're playing a big game tomorrow. They're playing Iowa. Number, uh, I believe they're number 22 okay. right now. So that's a huge game, another prove it game because if they come out like they did against Michigan, they, Daniel, they were ready. They, they never trailed in the game. They came out guns blazing and never, never put the brake on the gas like they they were it came I out that. i need to watch the highlights i feel like a fake fan now <laughs> <laughs> the men's team that was so painful to watch it's like we can't get yeah. a bucket it's i just... would recommend watching the women's team over the men's team for sure because i was like you i watched probably about 15 minutes of the men's game today and i was like Man, between this and the North Dakota State blowout, like, there's nothing on. <laughs> I know. Trey McGowan's needs to come back. <sighs> I know. We need some back. Because, like, Trevor Lakes is getting minutes. Lat Mayan has not been playing well. Um, yeah. I didn't really see k today, and he's not very good on defense because he's undersized. Kobe Webster's undersized. It's just it, – they're just not that good. They're just not good. It's just as simple as that. They're not. So – um, we were close against Ohio State and I believe one other team, but, you know, they didn't pull it out like all our men's sports. So <laughs> anyway, I don't know if much more needs to be said about all that. Exciting so, things from the portal. That's for sure. Yeah, they, the portal, man. Um, I'm not I still am not drinking any Kool-Aid because I had a nightmare last night that we like lost a close football game. I'm not even kidding. Like I literally had a nightmare last night that like we lost a close game. I don't maybe it was like to Illinois or something. Like oh. I woke up like ah. Oh, you were at the- not calling the plays. Everything's gonna be fine. Okay. <laughs> Fell back asleep. You were at the Illinois game earlier this year, weren't you? Yeah, it was I went into the Illinois game last year. I mean, this first game, and mentally I had no expectations. I drank zero Kool-Aid. 
I had heard all the bad rumors. I expected the worst, and the worst came, and I was like, all right, I'm here. Bye, That's <laughs> It was weird because I'd never done that in my life until then. So, yeah, that that was a rough game. I mean, there's been about like five or six times I feel like during the Frost era where I was like, man, this is rock bottom. <laughs> and then something else happens. Illinois was not rock bottom. Rock bottom was losing to Iowa. That's the that's where I that was my rock bottom. My rock bottom was Purdue this year. You were working that game. Uh, that no. was. I saw people was... like. Wait, wait, what are you gonna say? There were people that were leaving at like halfway through the end of the third quarter. I went downtown that night, and there were just people just fighting on O Street because they're just pissed that we can't win a day game. <laughs> they got some some good players but like they know how to put their players in position to make a play we were closer in that game than we should have been we should have thrown a pick six on our first drive yeah. somehow oh, did it yeah and then scored yeah, the, a touchdown no, yeah. I, will say, I don't think that that was necessarily rock bottom i know a lot of fans may think that but purdue was re- they're good they're they were a solid team this year like, they, they were more talented than Iowa. Obviously, they beat them. And so, like, I think that was, like, obviously it sucked because, like, that was probably one of the worst performances at Memorial Stadium this year. But, like, Purdue was good. That was another bowl game I was go- I forgot to mention that was uh, really entertaining was the uh, Purdue-Tennessee game. Uh, and also another one, I, I want to know what you think, the, the Mayo Bowl. The Mayo Bath. You see Wait, that? Wait, who was in the Mayo Bowl again? South Carolina, North Carolina. It was a pretty good game. I did watch that game. Uh, South Carolina looks like they're improving as well. They got uh, Rattler and uh, Oklahoma tight end. To, Stogner. Uh, yeah, Stogner. Yeah. They'll they're be, both going there. They're going to they're gonna be improving. Yeah. What did you think of the, uh, the Mayo Bath? Didn't they do it after the press conference? I think I saw that. Yeah. It's so dumb. I like the cheese it bath. I mean, they're all funny. And then the Idaho Potato Bowl, they just dumped the coach. Wyoming beat, like, I don't know. I forget who Wyoming beat, but they won. <laughs> and they got a fry bath. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, the mayo bath. It was, it was funny, but it was gross. But uh, they dumped they, – they went to dump the mayo, and, uh, like, the, the big cooler, like, nailed uh, Shane Beamer in the head. Like, they might need to put him in concussion protocol. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Okay, so this is one thing I forgot to talk about, but did y'all notice the ESPN coverage? It was, like, before or after the Rose Bowl, and, like, Herb Street and, like, all these other guys were, like, on set just going after all the people opting out of bowl games, right? And And then people were flaming them, like, your entire like TV schedule is built on making money off of them, but they can't like go make money off themselves and not risk their, you know, cause we saw Cor- Corral of Ole Miss, like hurt his ankle, you know? So. Yeah. He, he went, ended up in crutches. Yeah. The, that, that was certainly a take that Kirk Herbstreet had. And uh, I believe Reese Davis too also got some pushback and he was arguing with some people, but. Yeah, I mean, I certainly get their point of view with that. But, like, also, I don't know. Like, you you can't say that – like, it's just not true that kids don't like football as much as, like, people used to. Like, that's just not true. Like, I saw a bunch of things. Like, this weekend, for example, a lot of these players are sitting out this weekend in the NFL because the playoffs are next week. Do those guys not love football? Like, because, you know, like, like so, like, if Joe Burrow sits out, uh, Jalen Hurts is not playing tonight, like, do, is he not – does he not like football if he's, you know, not playing? Yeah. I, I think that's ridiculous. It's like, you know, Jamar Chase, if you listen to any interview with him, you can tell he loves football. But, like, sometimes, like, you're going to make a business decision, and when there's – millions of dollars on the line like it's hard for me to like 
it's easy for me, like sitting on my couch and like being a fan of the sport to be like, oh man, that sucks. I really wanted to watch, you know, like Kenneth Walker and Kenny Pickett play. But then you look at like when Jalen Smith a few years ago for Notre Dame, like basically destroyed his knee and went from being like a guaranteed top five, top 10 pick to being a late second round pick. Like that, that's millions of dollars go, you know, going away. And so, you know, obviously you, the game's just changing. And so you can't just stand there and, you know, criticize these kids when it's a lot more complicated than just, you know, I don't want to play because, you know, it's, it's too risky, I guess. Like, yeah, there's a lot of variables lot more at stake like I'm in the line of thinking where hey if a guy wants to sit out for for the draft so he can prepare great whatever go do your thing same but also if a guy plays like Matt Corral I also love that that's awesome like that shows but like I'm not gonna like look down at someone you know if if they're if they're doing it. especially like a running back or something like that because those careers in the NFL, they're not guaranteed. They don't last forever. Like, you're lucky if you last more than four years in the NFL. It's hard. So, like, get prepared now. Like, I, I can't blame a guy for wanting to do that. Any thoughts on this, Andrew? Oh, I, I kind of side with Sam. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, there's still college kids. It's, you know, they're our age which is crazy to think about. And they're making these big lifetime decisions like that. And I don't think anybody is in any sort of place to sit there and criticize and tell them what's right or wrong for them. Cause at the end of the day, everyone's their own main character and they make their own decisions based off what's best for them. And who are we to sit there and criticize them for their decision-making when clearly there's a problem going the other direction or taking the ladder, for instance. But um, you know, you, you, all you can do as a fan and that's strictly what we are at the end of the day is just fans, you know, and I understand fans do have a partial influence on a lot of those decisions, but you, at the end of the day, you just got to support them no matter what. So uh, like Sam said, it's a business decision and especially at such a young age and a league that necessarily isn't uh, guaranteed, you know, it, it's just kind of about, making the right decision for yourself so can't really blame someone for making a decision like that but you know yep. I like just I said, they're just, our age when people like are outraged about like everything like th there's always like someone needs to have a take like every single day like just let let these kids you know be kids they're not perfect like yeah i agree uh, I think we all got pretty good common sense on this. You got to let people decide for themselves. And I mean, hey, in three years, when Decoldis Crawford opts out of the Rose Bowl, I hope <laughs> that we have some depth. So uh, I, think, I think we should just end it on that. <laughs> nah, I got, honestly would be so happy at this point to have our best players opting out of a bowl game. Because it oh. would mean that, number one, we have depth and that we're a good team again. So I would, I'd be complimented by that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'd, I'd take that any day. I think any Nebraska fan would take, honestly, like, not, they would do anything for 9-4, and four, but they would be very happy just being, like, 7-5, and five, I feel like. Not long-term, but, like, next year, yes. Maybe, yeah, well, especially with the schedule Nebraska has next year, 7-5, and five, that should honestly be the expectation, honestly. Once all this transfer portal stuff kind of thins out and we're, you know, reaching like May, June, we probably have a better idea. But I mean, I thought we were going to go eight and four like last year. And that was a good guess because we were in every single game. So, uh, I, yeah. I was like right where Vegas was at. I was like ah, six and six, maybe five and seven. Cause I saw the schedule. I'm like, man, that, that's, that's brutal. That's a brutal uh, conference schedule. And then you add in the Oklahoma game. And uh, this coming year, honestly, like, yeah, we have I'm to. Curious to see what Vegas thinks, Nebraska, what, what their win toll is going to be next year. I would have to guess it'd probably be around the same, like six, 
and a half, probably seven, just to play it safe because the schedule's pretty favorable. But also tons of turnover, you know, new staff basically entirely on the offense. So. This has been Daniel Magnuson with Sam Alessandro and Andrew Pfeiffer. I'm on the damn ball. And we're out.